Past success is the first of our performance metrics. It's uh, arguably probably the most easily understood, it's certainly a very commonly used metric. Uh, basically measures, was the user able to do a particular task that was set? Yes or no. That said, one of the most important things when we're thinking about using task success as a metric is to make sure that we define tasks that have a well-defined, quantifiable, measurable, identifiable end state. We know when that task has been completed, we're able to, to answer that. And we should do that before we run the, the experiment. We should know what task success, what task completion looks like to make sure then that that is what we are measuring our task success against. An important aspect of this is that sometimes um, a, success, a successful task in the user's point of view may not necessarily be successful from a different perspective. And that gets into instances where the user indicates that they have finished the task, they're happy that they have been they've done what they were asked to do, but from the, uh, let's say from the developer's point of view or the experimenter's point of view, they haven't done it correctly, they haven't done it fully, there's some aspect here. And that actually can be quite interesting because there we have a situation where the user thinks one thing and the experimenter thinks a different thing. It may be an indication of where the test hasn't been particularly clearly defined, so the user got confused. It may also expose a perfectly legitimate usability problem in terms of the underpinning application or as interface where the user has misunderstood some aspect and that can then um, be improved to improve the usability of the system. Commonly, when we think about task success, we can view it as a binary measurement. It is either successful or not. Either you pass the test or you don't. There's, there's no sort of intermediate stage in it. If that's the case, we can measure it sort of as, really sort of as nominal data. It's, it's pass or fail, simple as that, and, and measure these different types of activities. If we classify them as a one and a zero, it gives us ways then of, of using some of our statistical approaches to analyze the task data that we receive. That said, there are different reasons why a task may fail, and quite often it is useful to alongside thinking about task success and measuring that, to also record the reasons why a task failed. Because generally, task failing is not something that you want to do. You want to understand the reasons why and then go about improving those aspects to increase the percentage of tests that do pass. So we have some of the reasons here why a test may fail. It's not an exhaustive list, but it lists some common ones. So the first one may be that the user gives up, that the user indicates that you know if they were doing the task on their own they would have stopped at this point they don't want to carry on don't know what to do they just given up alternatively the moderator um, may also stop the task that the user may be getting confused has not been able to find things and the moderator just goes you know look let's, let's stop at this point there's no point carrying on alternatively you may define that there are certain criteria like a maximum duration and if you go beyond that maximum duration it's the same as a task failure effectively and the bottom one is what we've talked about is that the participant has um, incorrectly indicated they complete the task they from their point of view they've done what they were fast but from the experimenter's point of view it hasn't been what they were asked or what they've done has not been correct in some sense and that's very interesting ones because you don't get into questions around is it simply an experimental design? Is there some confusing element? Are there fundamental differences between the mental model and the conceptual model between the user and the software that they're using? So in practice, it is, where possible, a good idea then to record the reasons for task failure because that can help with subsequent analysis. Important as well, because here we are dealing with uh, binary data if we're thinking about either being passed or failed. It's, it's nominal data, it's ordinal data, it depends if you want to order the thing. It's certainly not interval data or ratio data. So it means then that whenever we're thinking about this statistically, and also combined with the fact that our sample sizes will probably not be that large, we, we can end up with a situation where our confidence intervals 
are, are going to be actually quite large. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty around it. Now, there, there has been a number of statistical techniques that people have looked at where you have this type of sort of binary, reasonably small sample size, and, and what gives you, if you like, a best outcome, not in terms of favorable results, but best in terms of most accurate model. And there's one known as the adjusted wall that is particularly suitable where we have binary, reasonably sort of low sample sizes. And if you're using collecting that type of data, you can see the link on the screen here. Do have a look at the, the confidence interval calculator in that particular one, or just Google for adjusted walled uh, calculator. You'll find a number of them online. Use that for analyzing uh, your data. Time on task then is the next one. And it's related to task success because it is simply measuring the length of time that the user took on that task. Um, can also be known as completion time or task time. And again, it's, it's a useful additional insight, not only to the, was the user able to do it, but how long did it take? And whenever we go on to think about efficiency, and particularly how do we show improvements in efficiency, then time on task is an important element because in that sense then, we are able, it, it is, is interval data, we are able to compare it um, against one another in terms of, of, of the, the, the differences between different measurements. So it's, it's really important for any product where the user may perform a certain task repeatedly. If that's the case, we want to make sure that that particular task can be completed in the minimum amount of time um, safely in all of those types of aspects as well. So where we have frequently performed tasks, that's a good indication of ones where we should be looking at the time and task measurement of it. Thankfully, it's reasonably straightforward to, to measure. Most cases, you have a start time when you begin it, and, and then you again, you have a defined end point or conditions under which you would end the particular test. If you're calculating this metric, you also find that it can be linked into return investment. So if you have two different approaches, um, and you're testing a new approach and it saves, it can be done 20% quicker than the old approach, you actually then can use that saving in time to work out what that means for potentially a return on investment. If you were to spend this amount of money developing that feature and it saved the users this amount of money overall, what does that equate to then in terms of an overall net investment and return on that? Collecting, analyzing time and task data, it's quite straightforward. It's just simply the gap between the start and the end of the, the task. Uh, we can look at average user completion for each of them. Um, it is important to look at the distribution in, across this here just to see, is it a normal distribution where most users take the same with a bit of variation around it, or is it some other type of distribution? Particularly important as well to, to think about potentially for outliers where most people maybe did it in 10 seconds, but you could have one user that spent 25 minutes on it. Um, maybe legitimately, not legitimately, but that item of data you may want to excise from the, the test set because it will limit your ability to meaningfully calculate statistics on, on the rest of the data um, uh, where we have outliers. So that's all we want to look at in the, inside this section, both task success and time on task. They're, they're easily calculated, easily understood, but yet really very useful performance metrics. And they sort of form the, the bread and butter of the type of metric that we can certainly monitor when we're thinking about users' abilities to do defined tasks.